to this week's edition of Mobile Education by Mobile Tech Expo, presented by The Rag Company. I'm Sheldon Kay, the MTE Show Manager, and just want to say thank you to The Rag Company for, as always, being our big sponsor. want to show a little video from them real quick. All right, thanks again to the Rag Company. So today we have Bulletproofing, Pandemic Proofing, Your Business, presented by Ivan LaCroix. So Ivan, thank you for being here and go ahead and take it. Well, hello everyone. I'm happy to be here uh, and happy to be part of this educational series put on by Mobile Tech Expo and our friends at the Rag Company. Today, we're going to be talking about pandemic proofing, or if you prefer, bulletproofing your business. Now, the pandemic is about a year old, and a lot of you have lived through it and actually strived through it. And that is a great thing. Uh, before I go any further, by the way, feel free to ask questions. We are here to answer questions. I don't have that long of a presentation, actually. But nonetheless, I'm here to answer your questions. And if I don't get to your questions during the live presentation, I will definitely read through all the questions and write an answer later on. So once again, thank you very much for joining us. And here we go, pandemic proofing your business. The first part of pandemic proofing your business is making sure that your business is efficient and making sure that your business is actually a business. Now, in that I mean, you need to have profitability. And if you don't have profits, you don't have a business. If you were to be sick tomorrow, or for a week, or want to take a holiday for two weeks, would your business survive? Well, if the answer is no, you're definitely not pandemic proof. But if Uh, stand by. It looks like we might have lost Ivan there. Probably a little technical glitch. So hopefully he'll be back here in a second. If anyone knows him, you know, maybe text and remind him to get back on. But, you know, while we're here again, thanks to the Rag Company. Also, we have a couple other sponsors. Uh, I do want to thank uh, G Technique, uh, Coach Me, and PNS Detailing. Uh, thank you so much for helping out with this production. And, you know, couldn't do it without you guys. So still no Ivan. I hope you guys got to join us, um, you know, last Friday for our community night. Had a good time, gave away a bunch of prizes. Uh, had some great feedback too. So we're hoping we're actually going to get to do it again soon. Uh, we're looking to maybe do it as a monthly series now and bring in some couple guest speakers to share some success you know, success stories and some good tips on business and all that kind of stuff. Just real quick, fun things while we all share a pint together. So stay tuned for more info on that. And unfortunately, I don't know any jokes or anything. Oh, and Ivan is back. Bring him back in here. So, He's back. All right. I'm going to get. Oh, thanks, Ivan. Where did I leave off? I know exactly where, uh, where I was when I left, when we lost me. So if you could uh, let me know, Sheldon, that would be great. Or actually, I'll just start from the beginning. Uh, so once again, Ivan LaCroix here, Detailers Business Academy. Happy you're with us. And if you have any questions, please write them in the notes below. I'll go back if I don't answer the questions during this live feed. I'll make sure to answer your questions afterwards. Now, pandemic proofing your business is an important part of being a business owner. It's an important part of being an entrepreneur. And if your business isn't pandemic proof, well, it's not life proof either. Now, this pandemic has been with us for a year now and it's affected a lot of us. And some of us it's affected in a good way, some of us in a bad way. A lot of the detailers that I coach are actually doing better now than before the pandemic. And the reason they're doing that is it's given them a time to look at their business and find out exactly what they were doing wrong and what they were doing right. 
one of the things that you really need to focus on is profitability. Because if you're not making profits, you won't be there to serve your customers in the future. Now, can you afford to be off sick for a week? Can you afford to go on holidays for two weeks or a month? Well, if you can't and your business will die and go away if you're not there for a few days or a few weeks, then your business really isn't a business and it's really not pandemic proof. One of the reasons we need to make profits is to be able to make it through times like these. Uh, I'm in Quebec, Canada. We have this thing called winter here. Not everybody lives in San Diego where it's 70 degrees year round. Here in the winter, things slow down considerably when it comes to detailing. And you know, when you have a foot of snow that's fallen in five hours, yeah, people don't necessarily want to have their cars washed or cleaned or detailed or coated or what have you. So we need to really look at our savings throughout the year and decide at the end of the year, which for us, our year end was the 1st of April, a funny April Fool's joke, but it allowed us to see what we did in the last 12 months. And yes, in February, we were actually losing money. Uh, you know, a month like January, February, especially when it got cold and snowy and blowy, yeah, we would still pay our employees, we'd still pay our mortgage, our rent, our insurance, all of that. So our expenses sometimes were actually higher than our income. But we had enough left over from the previous summer to make it through without an issue. So that is a big consideration, is your profitability. The other thing you need to consider in pandemic proofing or bulletproofing your business is not only relying on one customer or one type of customer. You need to have various sources. Dealerships still sold cars throughout the pandemic. Therefore, since they still sold cars, they were able to quite easily take on your detailing services. And a lot of them, they unfortunately weren't able to bring their own staff in to do detailing, but they were able to hire it out. And depending on the size of your company, depending on the jurisdiction you're in, some of you were allowed to operate, some of you weren't. So it's something to consider. The other thing is, what services are you offering? And you need to offer a variety of services. The more services you offer, the more pandemic proof or recession proof or whatever proof, bulletproof, your business is. So if you're offering just ceramic coatings, that's all I do, I do nothing else. Or I just do interiors, I do nothing else. You may not be exactly bulletproof. Now, if you're offering anything from a hand wash up to a full wet sand and polish and everything in between, then yes, you have more of a chance of getting business and getting things organized and being able to weather a storm. Another aspect to consider when you're talking about pandemic proofing or bulletproofing your business is knowing your numbers. You know, a lot of detailers, if they were to go on Shark Tank tomorrow morning or tomorrow afternoon or whenever it airs, and one of the sharks would say, well, what are your numbers? Unfortunately, a lot of you don't know your numbers. Know your numbers. Know exactly where you are, where you're going, and how you're going to get there. And that helps you, again, get through one of these pandemics or whatever natural disaster the world is throwing at us. What happens when you know your numbers is you know what you can afford to do, you know what you can't afford to do, and you know where your strengths are. And a lot of detailers don't know where their strengths or where their weaknesses are. They just know that, hey, I made $2,000 this week. Perfect. But what service made you the most hourly? What service did you actually lose money on? And a lot of you are actually losing money on services without knowing about it. A lot of people, it's interiors. Now, you'll charge $100, $150 an hour to polish a car, but then you'll do an interior for $150 and take six hours to do it. So that's only $50 an hour. That's not good. That's really, really bad, actually. And no, that's uh, $25 an hour. Yeah, bad math on my part. Nonetheless, you've taken so long to do that interior, but you feel you can't charge for it. And any service that you have that's that shouldn't be around. You shouldn't have what's considered a loss leader. There shouldn't be a loss in any service you provide. You should have all sorts of things on the services you provide, but losses are not one of them. Now, one thing you can do is have an economy service or one that attracts customers. In my case, we had a hand car wash. Now that hand car wash, yeah, we charged $20. We actually made money on the $20 hand car wash, but what it was 
for us was our best form of advertising. It got people in the door, no matter what the outside temperature was, no matter what was going on, it got people to come to us because people still want to drive a clean car. So that car wash, even though it wasn't the biggest money maker, it was a continual feed of leads for us. So instead of paying for Facebook ads, instead of paying for Google ads, well, we just had to wash someone's car and we had everything in front of us. We were able to, doing that car wash, go to people and say, hey, while you're here, I noticed your car is contaminated. Would you like us to decontaminate it? Or you could really use a paint correction. Or do you want us to clean the interior? All things like that. So when you're considering services, look at every service you offer, look at how long it takes you, how much you're charging, and it should balance. And if it doesn't balance, look at ways of improving it. Another thing you can do to pandemic proof your business is efficiency. The more efficient you are, the higher quality you're gonna produce and the higher quality you produce, the happier your customers, but also that efficiency raises your profits. And once again, profits are the most important part of customer service. If you're not profitable, you won't be around to serve your customers for much longer. So you need to make profits. And it's something that is easy to describe to a customer they know you're in, a, you're in business. They know you're there to make money. You're not there because you love cleaning cars. We all do, we're detailers, that's part of it. But if we just love detailing cars, we wouldn't necessarily have our own business. We could work for someone else doing it. But no, we decided to start our own business. We decided to be an entrepreneur. And if you're an entrepreneur, assume it, live with it, run with it, and be a real entrepreneur. And a real entrepreneur knows, again, their numbers. They know what's good for them. They know what's bad. And you're always trying to evolve. You're always trying to make your business better. And bettering your business can be a lot of things. It could be renovating. It could be cleaning up. It could be hiring new employees. It could be growing. It could be shrinking. It really doesn't matter. But you run your own business. And you need to know exactly why you're running it, how you're running it, and where you're running it to. Now. Do we have any questions yet? No. Uh, well, yes, I think this is on Facebook, but nonetheless. So we don't have any questions yet, but uh, we're working on it. The, uh, the other item that you need to do to pandemic proof your business is if you can have employees, the bigger your business is, generally speaking, the easier it's going to be to weather a storm. The easier it is to go over little bumps in the road. And the bigger it is, the easier it is, it actually is easier to manage a larger business because you get a, a better, sorry, you get a better cash flow. And when you have a better cash flow situation, that cash flow situation allows you to do a better job. It allows you to go through these storms. Now, again, profits, quality, efficiency, all these things are very important to pandemic proofing your business. Another thing you can do to help you weather these storms is, and I'll have to find another thing other than weathering the storms, but anyways, the what else you can do is have subcontractors. If you have a shop and you're paying rent, but you have a mobile, another mobile detailer in the area, you have a PDR guy, you have someone doing um, window tinting, PPF, whatever services you don't offer, Offer them, offer to sublet part of your shop to them and have them as subs. And having subs and offering more and more products to your customer, even though you don't have to physically do it, but you just know a guy that does and bring that person in. And when you bring that person in, you make profits on them. They're happy because now they have a warm roof to work under or a cool roof, depending on where you are. And it allows them to carry their business through and allows you to carry your business. Another aspect, especially for mobile detailers, uh, when pandemic, especially when dealing with a pandemic, people are concerned about cleanliness. People are concerned about spreading the disease, obviously. Uh, so in that case, or spreading the virus in our case. So when you're talking about that, you need to clarify with your customers that yes, our business is pandemic proof. And pandemic proof in your business or virus proofing your business means that you take the precautions necessary put forward by the CDC. And those precautions 
I know that there are some people that are non-believers in the pandemic. Uh, some people think it's a hoax, whatever. Whatever your beliefs are, that's fine. But for your customers, their belief is, generally speaking, that the pandemic exists. So you need to advertise to that. And you need to step up, actually, your advertising to show that you're a responsible business, that you're doing what you can to help people get through the pandemic. And cleaning is one of them. Now, detailing doesn't necessarily get rid of viruses on the interior. We know that. There are ways of doing it. There are proper chemicals. And you can help the spread or reduce the spread of the virus by cleaning the interior of the car. Now, as detailers, most of us prefer cleaning the exterior of the car. It's not going to do anything for the virus. But keeping the interior clean and having a standard operating procedure in place so that when your customers are considering bringing their car to you, you can have curbside drop off. So you drop your car off. We never contact the customer. We never see the customer. We're never face to face, but they can drop the car off, put the keys in a drop box. Once they've left, you go out, you clean the steering wheel, you clean the door handle, things like that before getting in the vehicle. Then you get in, drive it in, and then do what you have to do. And when you put it back outside, you have another wipe down regime. So everything that your employee or you could have touched, the shifter, the doorknobs, the uh, steering wheel, etc., wipe them down as you're exiting the vehicle, wipe the door handle as you close it, and then put the keys in it, wipe the keys down, put them in an envelope for your customer to recoup when they come back to pick the car up. Payment can be handled through all sorts of uh, different applications. There's a lot of them out there, uh, you know, the good old PayPal and all its new competitors. So you can handle payment that way. If you have a CRM like you're able, it handles payment through that application. So you can, or through that CRM, I should say. So you're able to, you can take it through there. Uh, having a CRM while I'm on the subject is a great way of helping your business strive and survive. Uh, what a CRM can do for you is put a little touch of business in your entrepreneurship. And that little touch of business is friendly reminders to customers, uh, getting, you know, keeping and maintaining your customer list. There are a lot of you that have a customer list sort of in your head. I could go back through the invoices, but you don't actually have a customer, an actual customer list with phone numbers, emails, et cetera, et cetera. What a good CRM will do is keep that customer list for you. And if you want to send out a reminder, if you want to send out a, a mass email or text message campaign to your customers, you can with the touch of a button. It's that easy. So it's not a difficult process to do. And it's something that you should be considering. So if you don't have a CRM, it's a very great investment in your business. And one that, again, is going to help you get through these things. Now, another item that we want to do is look for upsells. Look for ways that, yes, if I'm not dealing with that many cars, the cars that I am dealing with, I want to get the maximum amount of return out of. And that maximum amount of return comes through upsells and making sure that you're profitable with every step that you do. An easy upsell, obviously, is interior uh, decontamination at this time. It's doing things like changing the air filter, the cabin air filter. That is an easy upsell. You can make money doing it. Uh, if you have a, just a basic set of tools, and a lot of vehicles don't even need any tools to change the cabin filter. Uh, don't tell your customer that. But nonetheless, changing a cabin filter is a good way of aiding the customer and you. Coatings, if you're not doing ceramic coatings, you need to do ceramic coatings. Even through the pandemic, when people were freaking out and had stay-at-home orders, they were still getting their cars coated. Yeah, people were still buying new cars. Uh, leases came up to end. People were having accidents, whatever. They still needed a new car. They're still getting cars coated. And a coating has a high profit margin, generally speaking. So with that high profit margin, comes a little reserve for you in the future. And you should always have that reserve. I like having a 30% profit margin. So I actually build it into my pricing. And with that 30% profit margin, you don't touch that profit margin 
till your year end is here. And then you can use that profit margin. But that profit margin isn't to pay your salary. The profit margin is pure 100% unadulterated profits. Your salary should be figured into what you're charging your customer. And then on top of that, you also want to figure in your retirement fund. Again, you want to make sure that your business can weather these storms. Sorry. Uh, your business can get through anything, be it a pandemic, be it a, uh, you know, a power outage. Uh, in 1998, we had a power outage in Quebec that lasted two weeks. Now, not many people were detailing during the power outage. Everything was shut down because there was literally no power here. And people were concerned about heating their homes because it was in January. It was a little cold outside. These are things that happen. There are natural disasters that can happen. Uh, you know, if you think of the people in California with the forest fires, again, those businesses weren't operating. And you need to have enough reserves set aside, and that comes through your profits, that, hey, if I had to shut down for a month, wouldn't be an issue. Of course, I wouldn't have too many profits left, but nonetheless, there'd still be money in the bank. I'd still be paying what I need to pay. I can still pay my employees and I can still carry on. Um, I'm just trying to refresh my screen here. Okay, so at this point, this is when I ask you for questions. And if you don't have any questions, I don't have much more to say on the subject. Uh, basically, pandemic proofing your business is just being a good, solid business owner. It's being forward in your thinking. It's not being closed on different things. Uh, it's being able to move forward, even though you don't have means to move forward. And accumulating those means, getting that money, saving it up is a big part of it. And then offering different services, offering things that nobody else is thinking of offering. Uh, and it's a good way to reinvent yourself sometimes. And worst case scenario, it's time to clean the shop up. It's time to reorganize your mobile rig. It's time to make your business into a business. So go through your website, go through your Facebook pages, go through your Instagram, uh, your Google. Make sure all your reviews on the different review platforms are good and answered as well. Uh, so there's a lot of things we can do when we're actually not working. And part of a, being an entrepreneur is knowing that you shouldn't actually be working in your business. You should be working on your business. And working on your business is very different than being out there polishing a car. It's being out there talking with customers. It's being out there on your Facebook. It's being out there on your social media. It's being out there to attract new customers to you. And also to satisfy and maintain your existing customers. Hey, I mean, it does look like we got a question. Um, Tug asked, could you elaborate on how you would sell a coating? So selling a ceramic coating, uh, pandemic or pandemic, ceramic coating is something that's very simple to do. First of all, as a detailer, you need to make sure that your vehicle is ceramic coated because if your vehicle is ceramic coated, you'll be able to understand and also talk to the customer about the benefits of a ceramic coating. And as a detailer, we think the benefits of a ceramic coating are, Ooh, the paint is glossy and it beads water for the customer. That's generally not the benefit. The biggest benefit of a ceramic coating for most customers is time savings. They're saving time. They're not having to bring their car to the detailer every three months to have it waxed. They're not having to wash it as often. Their car, even when it's dirty, still looks better than some clean cars because of the ceramic coating. The other thing a ceramic coating does for a customer is it protects their investment. Now, a vehicle is normally the second biggest investment any of us make. And if we were to take a car, drive it off the dealer's lot, and for three years, never change the oil. The day before we go to trade it in, we go to Jiffy Lube, have them change oil, the check engine light goes out, we return that car to the dealership, it's not worth a penny less than had we changed oil every 3,000 miles. But don't maintain your paint for three years. 
do nothing. Then just go to a car wash, have them wash it and take it to the dealership. And you'll see just how money, how much money you've lost because of the because of the vehicle looking bad. So a ceramic coating protects their investment. A ceramic coating saves the customer time. And those are the two biggest concerns for most customers. Now, as detailers, sure, it's shiny, it's glossy, it's slick, it beads water like crazy. Those are all nice things. But generally speaking, they're not exactly what your customer wants or what your customer desires. And as detailers, we also have a tendency to go over and above on a lot of things. And one of those over and above things is polishing the vehicle. A coating doesn't need perfect paint to be applied. So any vehicle is a candidate for ceramic coating. And if you take that into account, that any vehicle can be a candidate for ceramic coating, that opens a lot of things up. Of course, you have a, you know, a car that's worth $3,000, you're not going to put an $1,800 coating on it. But on the other hand, you can have a lower cost option and get the customer intrigued and part of being a coating customer is knowing that that coding, what it does for you. Now, if you have employees, this is a great way of training your employees for ceramic coatings and also for sales. What we would do in our shop is after they pass their probation period, we would actually ceramic coat half the employee's car, not the whole car, just half of it. And then let them drive around like that for a few months. Any one of my employees could sell you a ceramic coating without even thinking about it because they weren't selling anything to you. They were explaining in their own words why it's the best thing they've ever had on their car, why they feel that a ceramic coating is the best protection you could do. It's the best investment you could do to your car in the long run because they lived it. They saw it. They drove through rain. They drove through snow. Uh, they washed their vehicles. So do the same. If you don't have a ceramic coating on your car, hey, very easy. Put it on half your vehicle only and then drive it around that way for a little while. And you'll be able to sell ceramic coatings to anyone because you're not selling, you don't need to look at ceramic coatings as selling a ceramic coating. When you're talking about a ceramic coating, it's the best service as a detailer you can offer your customer. It's the best thing you can do for your customer. And being that way, you should be very enthusiastic about it. Now, I'm not talking about Ronco Popeil enthusiastic about, hey, how much for all of this? No. You need to be enthusiastic, maybe not quite that much, but you need to know what you're talking about. You need to know your coding. And if you don't have coding on your own vehicle, how can you propose it to a customer? That's awesome advice. I love the idea of the half coat. Um, we do have another question here. You were talking about CRMs. Uh, Glenn was asking, what exactly is a CRM? Customer relation management software. A CRM does a lot of things for you. Uh, one of the things that a CRM will do is assist you in running your business and assist you in that relationship with customers. So an example, uh, you're able, one of the CRMs that I like to use, it does a lot of things for the detailer. One of the things that it does is it tracks all your customers. So that is from a business aspect, that's great. Secondly, it can automatically uh, send a message to the customer before their detail to remind them that, hey, you have a detail coming up at this date at this time, just confirmation. The other thing that it does is after you've done the detail, it will send another email to the customer or text messages, whatever the customer chooses, by the way. It will contact the customer and say, hey, are you happy with the detail? And if you are happy with the detail, could you kindly leave a review here? and provide links to your Facebook, your Google, what, wherever you want reviews left. The other thing that it does is with every service that's offered, so let's say you're doing a just a wash and wax package. Well, we know that wax doesn't last longer than three months. So you can program into that, that after two and a half months, your CRM automatically contacts the customer and sends them a friendly reminder that, hey, you had your car waxed two and a half months ago and wax lasts three months. So We'd like to schedule another appointment with you to make sure you're keeping that protection. That's what a CRM can do for you. It basically takes away the, the little mundane tasks that we all know we need to do and we all know we should do, 
but a lot of us don't do because it takes a lot of time. That's good. Um, Zen Auto Detailing was asking, when should a mobile detailer consider moving to a shop? The day they start detailing. Uh, now, let me explain that. A lot of mobile detailers have the impression that a shop has a lot of overhead. And yes, a shop has a different type of overhead than a mobile business. Now, a mobile business, I ran a mobile business for years, and I ran both shop and mobile. They both have their good points. But a shop, especially if you're talking about a pandemic, is a much better alternative. Now, the reason it's a better alternative is in a mobile situation, you have much higher overhead, generally speaking, than a shop. Now, your overhead is very different. In a shop, your overhead is fixed cost. Your overhead is rent. Your overhead is heating, is lighting, is all those things. In a mobile situation, your overhead is calculated in negatives. I lost an hour in traffic. That's an hour I didn't make money. I lost half an hour setting up, tearing down. While I was detailing the car, the landscaper came by. I had to start over again, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It rained. It snowed. All those things make it so that you can't work or detail 40 hours a week. If you own a shop, and let's say your hours are eight to five, Monday to Friday, well, you can show up at 7.45 and be working at eight o'clock in the morning. And at five o'clock, you stop, and at 5.05, you're on your way home. Whereas a mobile detailer, let's say you approach your van at 7.45 in the morning. By the time you drive to your first customer, what time is it? Then you need to set up, do the job, tear down, move on to the next customer. How much time did you waste setting up, tearing down, and moving to the next customer? That is time that you're not making money. And unfortunately, customers don't take mobile detailing quite as seriously as they do a shop. And in doing so, they expect a mobile detailer to charge less than a shop. And in a shop-based environment, we can do gain time. And it's something very familiar in the automotive world, be it body shops or mechanics, is that if the book says this is supposed to be a four hour job and you can get it done in two, well, you still get paid four hours. Whereas a mobile detailer, if you show up to a customer's house, get that job done, you're particularly in a good spirit that day, you're organized, everything is going well. The customer thinks it should be a four hour job and you get it done in two, the customer all of a sudden is going, hey, wait, I thought I was paying you $50 an hour, and now it's $100 an hour. Something's wrong. So that is another liability of the mobile detailer. So a mobile detailer, uh, you know, you're wanting to consider a shop. Well, if you're at that point where you're thinking, should I move to a shop? The answer is yes. Uh, and when you're looking at a shop, you know, the shop is one part of it. Another part of it is, what are you, where is the shop located? Uh, if you're in the back 40 of an industrial mall, you're going to have to do a lot of advertising to get people to come to you. Now, if you're on a prime retail location, yes, you're going to pay more rent, but you're going to spend a lot more getting people to come to you. Uh, my last shop was sandwiched between a Hyundai dealership, a Volkswagen dealership, and I had a Ford dealership across the street. It was a great location. I didn't have to advertise to get people to come to my door. They naturally came to our door. It was the busiest road in town, and I was smack dab in the middle of all the dealerships. So, yes, I paid more for it, but it was definitely worth it in the amount of savings that I had. So when you're looking at a shop, be careful not to pigeonhole yourself so far into a, uh, you know, a back 40 area that customers can't find you, get to you, etc. The other thing is, especially if it's your first lease, make it a short-term lease. The reason you want to make it a short-term lease is a lot of people generally don't, or a lot of people underestimate what, how much that people underestimate how much space they're going to need and how fast their business can grow if they want to grow it. So if you have space for one vehicle and you have the capacity of doing two or three a day, you'll want more space. So that first lease when you're going for it, make it a short-term lease. 
Any other questions? Uh, yeah, Tug was asking, how do I offer an interior detail price in person when the customer never takes them up on it? So I guess how do they come up with that price when they just never get anyone to actually do it, I think is what he's saying. Uh, a few things. Your presentation may be a little off. Uh, the other thing is it's actually a very good thing to do a one-on-one a, a -on -one estimate with the customer. And you can point out without being rude and without going, ooh, you've got McDonald's french fries between the, the steering, or, you know, between the uh, console and the seat. Ooh, I don't eat those things. Nonetheless, you want to point out what you can do for the customer and be enthusiastic about it. Tell the customer, look, we're going to do our best deep cleaning on your vehicle. We're going to make it as good as it possibly can be, and sometimes as good as new. The other thing is, if you're having problems closing your sales, you know, instead of watching things like this, uh, you should be, you know, reading books on selling. You should be reading books on closing. You should be reading books on being a business owner and looking at those videos because the the detailing aspect of it, we all have down. It's not difficult to clean an interior of a car. It's not difficult to polish paint. It's not difficult to apply coatings. In fact, just about anybody can do it. But where we strive, where we're a business, is we're, as I mentioned before, we're saving the customer time. We all know anybody can wash and wax their car. Why do they come to a detailer? Because they don't have time. Take a lawyer, charges $200 an hour. So for him to wash, wax his car, if it takes him two hours, that just cost him $400. If you charge him $100, he saved $300 by having you do it. And if you think your pricing is too high, it probably isn't. What Again, what your concern should be is, how am I presenting it to the customer? How am I selling to the customer? And are you doing a follow-up? So once you've had the customer in front of you, always try to capture at least their cell phone number, if not their email. And then after they come to you, send them an email. Say, hey, thank you for coming in. Just want to go over that estimate. This is what we're going to do to your vehicle. This is how we're going to do it. And here's a few before and after shots for you. And you show a few before and after, you know, some bad interiors. And then here are some Google reviews. So you actually put links to your really good Google reviews. And once they've read three or four of your Google reviews, even though you provided the link, they're not going to go searching everywhere else. Then finally, at the bottom of the email, here are our available times. Which one would you like to book? And you don't give them the option of saying no. The option is these are available times. Which one is good for you? So it's a selling is a different mentality. Selling is part of being a business owner. It's part of being a detailer. It's part of being an entrepreneur. So you need to up your sales game. You need to work on your selling in order to close those deals. Now, you might be, sorry, not too expensive, but if you consider your prices too expensive, so will your customer. So let's say a, a coating just a, it's a, an easy subject to talk about because interiors are extremely variable is there dog hair is there all sorts of things but a coating is simple now if you're talking about a coating to the customer and you can't afford fifteen hundred dollars for a coating so since you can't afford it when you present it to the customer it's like yeah well i could do a ceramic coating on your car but it's fifteen hundred dollars no now the customer is concerned. But if you say, hey, we can do a ceramic coating in your car. It's going to turn out beautifully. And it's only $1,500. That attitude shift makes all the difference for the customer. Because now you are part of that deal. You are enthusiastic about it. And it's only $1,500. Meaning that you feel it's a good value. So your interior detailing, you need to feel before any customer will feel that it's a good value. And it should be a good value. Next. We have one from Rob. Uh, when detailing interiors, should he feel obligated to remove the seats if the vehicle needs it? Uh, he's concerned about time, liability, and then the space in his garage. Uh, concerned about three great things. First of all, time. No. No vehicle actually really needs the seats removed. Generally speaking, the tracks go back and forth far enough. 
And if the carpet under the seat is that bad, you might want to refuse that detail or tell the customer that, hey, you know, I can't necessarily get all those stains out. The other aspect is, as you mentioned, liability. And that liability is very, it's very real. It's very true. So if you have a customer that says, I want you to remove the seats to detail it. Perfect. Before I remove the seats, you're going to go to the dealership. You're going to buy new bolts because most of the bolts holding seats down are yield torque to yield, meaning that they're used once and only once. And I know from experience that those bolts at the dealership are not inexpensive. They're quite expensive. So what you want to do is dissuade your customer from wanting the seats removed. And also another thing is, generally speaking, under the seats, yeah, a few things got under there, but you can get at it with the proper tools. And the carpet normally isn't stained that badly under the seat that you can't clean it from getting beside the car and getting under there. And again, once you know the seat tracks on most vehicles move far enough forward and backwards that you can get to just about everything. So for myself and my shops, we never remove seats. It was just something we didn't do because of the time, because of the liability, because of the space, and it's really not necessary. Next. Uh, again, from Zen Auto Detailing, do you have any personal recommendations to get better at selling? Better, first of all, is being enthusiastic about what you're talking about. Are you really hyped up on detailing cars? Are you really satisfied with the results you're providing your customers? Are you satisfied with the coating you're selling them? Are you satisfied with what you're doing? And if you're not, then that needs to change. But you also need to be able to read the customer. And being reading the customer means what's their attitude? Sometimes I've seen detailers that go on and on and on and on and on when the customer was ready to say yes 10 minutes ago. And other times, the customer is never ready because they're just tire kickers and things like that. So you need to be able to read the customer to make sure that the customer is following what you're wanting and also what you're, you know, what's happening with that customer. The other thing is when you're selling and this goes to advertising and marketing, your advertising needs to show that you're enthusiastic. You know, I've seen too many detailers videos where they're literally standing there and they're afraid of the camera and you can tell they're afraid of the camera. And it's like, well, come to Joe's detailing. We'll make your car look like really good. No. Think of those really annoying commercials. You know, the, the Ginsu knife commercial. Well, the reason the Ginsu knife commercial was popular and the reason they sold a lot of those damn knives was simply because the presentation was over the top, was enthusiastic. For those of you that are a little older, remember the Ronco Pocket Pole Peel Fisherman? Yeah. Did anybody actually carry one of those in their glove box and stop at a, a river on the way home from work and fish and bring a fish home for work, uh, for supper? No. But they sold a lot of those pocket fishermen. And they ended up in drawers. They ended up on eBay, you know, years and years later because now they're a collector item but back then they weren't a collector item so they were able to sell all these things because of the presentation and your presentation is a big part of selling now another thing is you can go to a group like toastmasters so if you go on the web on the internet toastmasters.org toastmasters is a group of business owners and career people that get together on a regular basis normally once a week and it's all about communication. It's all about how you're presenting yourself, how you're presenting everything, be your look, your the way you speak, the way you engage, the way you shake hands, all of that is part of Toastmasters. Now, of course, with the pandemic, not gonna be shaking hands, and uh, you know, the, the meetings might be a little spaced out, at least six feet distance between people. That being said, Toastmasters is a great opportunity to grow your grow personally in your sales approach the other thing is there are a lot of great books out there and if you don't like reading books there's a lot of great podcasts and there's a lot of audiobooks one book that 
I've read many, many, many times in my life, and I try to read it at least once a year, is Dale Carnegie's How to Win Friends. Uh, yeah, just had a blank here. Uh, I'll put it down in the comments later. But Dale Carnegie's book on uh, how to win friends and influence people. Sorry. Uh, great book. It was written about 100 years ago, and it's still actual today. Sure, there are a few references in there, like Rolodex and dialing the phone might not exist anymore. But that being said, the book itself is a gold mine of information. And it's just, again, selling is a, a mindset. Selling is how you present yourself, how you're presenting your product, and how you're coming across. Next. All right, another one from Tug. How do I hire my first employee before I am busy enough to afford him? Well, your first employee, first, you need to have time to train them. But the next part of it is, if you're considering hiring an employee, that means you probably have enough work or close to it. The other aspect of that is, when your employee is in the shop working, you can be selling. You can be working on your business instead of working in your business. So you can be answering the phone when it rings instead of letting it go to voicemail. You can be returning emails immediately. You can be going forward and doing marketing. There's a lot of things you can do to work on your business instead of working in your business. And when your employee is now taking over the washing, taking over the polishing, taking over those items, that frees you up to be an entrepreneur instead of a detailer. So if you're considering hiring an employee, do it. Now, where do we find employees? I never hired anyone that was looking for work. I had a very weird way of looking at it. I was a great headhunter. So if I go into a restaurant and I get great service from the waiter, I'll try to hire them. Because detailing is something that you can learn quite easily. And you can start someone just washing the car and then you know, add skills as they go along. But just having someone to wash the cars for you, it's going to save you a lot of time. So it's something that if you find, you know, go to the hardware store and the person there is just exceptionally talented, knowledgeable, and they know what they're doing. Well, those are people that you can, again, headhunt. Uh, the other aspect or the other great way of getting employees is go to a temp agency. Now, a temp agency, you're going to pay a little more, but it gives you a three-month trial period to try the employee out. And if there's one day that you decide that that employee isn't for you, you don't tell the employee to walk out. You don't tell the employee to leave. You call the temp agency, they call the employee and they pull the employee out of there. So if you have reservations about hiring and firing employees, well, a temp agency is a great way of doing it. And a temp agency will not have detailing specific people. So you wanna hire janitorial people. If someone is willing to clean someone else's toilets, they'll do great at cleaning someone else's car. That, that's great insight there. Um, we have one more from Mark Kelly. What's a real advantage of a coating if it has to be maintained every three months with a topper that lasts three months? Why not just use a topper without a coating? In other words, why have a sacrificial layer for a coating? And this is really interesting to me because my car is ceramic coated. So I was kind of curious about yeah. this as well. Yeah. Okay. First of all, your dealing income requires you to put a topper on it every three months. It's not really a coating. A coating should last, let's say there's a five-year warranty. Well, that vehicle, that coated, should last five years without any toppers. Now, there is maintenance involved. Anything requires maintenance. You don't go out and buy a car today and not maintain it. And a car is a lot more expensive than the coating. But what the main, what the maintenance should be isn't adding something else on top. And if your coating that you're selling requires you to add something on top, you may want to consider another brand of coatings. That being said, maintenance. Uh, I'm in the Northeast. I'm in Quebec. We have salt on the roads. Salt basically kills the phobic action of a coating. And it doesn't matter what coating it is, salt is going to attract. So in the spring, just do a quick uh, quick wash with a mineral deposit remover, and we're good. The car now beads and sheets again like it should. You, The customer or the vehicle still needs to be decontaminated regularly. Now, 
what that schedule of decontamination is will be different for every customer. Is a car garage kept and only driven on the weekends? Or is it a daily driver that sits out on a construction site every day? So it can be every three months, it can be every six months, it can be every year, it can be every five years. That part of it. The coating itself is a sacrificial layer. And if you need to put a sacrificial layer on the sacrificial layer, then once again, consider another brand of coating. Uh, a coating should not require a topper. Now, if your customer wants to wash it and put toppers on them, great. But most coatings that advertise two, three, five years, that is their lifespan without any toppers. All right. Well, that's all we really have uh, right now. So um, do you have any uh, closing remarks or anything? Oh, we're all there. Well, first of all, thank you everyone for participating. Thanks for watching this. And those of you that are watching at a later date, again, uh, I'll get notifications for questions. I'll be happy to answer them. So if you have any questions, please leave them below. Always happy to answer. The other thing is, uh, if you want to, if you want to get a hold of me specifically, uh, I've got Facebook feeds. I have YouTube. I've got all, you know, any social media you're looking for me. Uh, I should be there. Just type my name and I'll, I'll pop up eventually. Uh, and once again, on those feeds, I'm happy to answer your questions, happy to, to help as well. Um, uh, for myself, you know, I'm, I'm here, I'm semi-retired. I'm doing coaching to help detailers become entrepreneurs. So if you want to up your detailing skills in terms of detailing your own business, as opposed to detailing someone else's car, eh, give me a call. Uh, and you know, the other thing is, I know the uh, that Mobile Tech Expo is a very big partner with the IDA. If you're not a member of the IDA, consider it. The IDA is a big part of our industry. It's growing every year. And the IDA, the International Detailing Association, is really international. And one uh, thing, one little plug for the IDA, the week of June 21st this year is going to be a worldwide skills validation event. So every registered trainer with the IDA, and I'm one of them, is putting on a skills validation testing locally some, at some point throughout that week. So wherever you are in the world, that week, there should be a skills validation session close to you. So you can do your certification online. And once, you, once you're a member, you have your certification online, then you can do your skills validation testing. And if you're asking, well, what's the IDA going to do for me? Nothing. The question you should be asking is, what can I do for the IDA? And uh, hopefully next year, or actually in the fall, when is the uh, Mobile Tech Expo in Vegas? Uh, August 26th through 28th, in Las Vegas, Nevada. Very good. So August 26th to 28th, I hope to see you all in Las Vegas. Uh, hopefully the pandemic will be far behind us at that point or you know, off in the distance anyways, and we can get together. Unfortunately, uh, we weren't able to get together for MTE in uh, Orlando this year. Looking forward to seeing everyone in Orlando next year. By then, definitely the pandemic should be behind us. Yep. Well, thank you, Ivan, so much. Uh, this was like really great session. Really enjoyed it. Um, thanks again to our sponsors, the Rag Company, G Technique, Coach Me, and PNS. Um, next week, we will continue this series. Uh, again, it will be a Thursday at 6 p.m. Eastern Time. We have Dave Streen presenting Discover the Difference a Little Marketing Can Do for You. So until next time, thank you all for joining us, either live now or you're going to watch us later. And Ivan, thank you again. And I can't wait to catch up with you in Vegas. Thank you very much.